40 years on the run have marked this man for life. A German soldier who escaped from a US prisoner of war camp and duped the FBI for decades, reinventing himself and living the American dream to the full. From fugitive to local hero and celebrity tennis pro, Gail Gertner, one of America's most wanted, became Dennis Wiles, a man blessed by fate. But just when the FBI was giving up the chase, it all went wrong and his life fell apart. Sixty years living on his nerves left him picking up the pieces, trying to reconcile a quiet American pensioner with Hitler's lost soldier. Dennis Wiles looks like an average retired American. He enjoys reading his paper and watching TV, the gentle pleasures of later life. But scratch the surface and Dennis is far from average. His life is quiet now, but for 40 years he was on the run, existing without an official identity and surviving on his wits. To find myself on, on the wanted list where all the murderers and criminals are, but it was, uh, of course, very, very sad for me. The whole thing about being a escapee or a fugitive is, is not a good thing. But this was not a life that young Gail Gertner, growing up in eastern Germany, could ever have imagined. He was from a respectable family, where religion, discipline and order were valued. So how did the young Georg find himself dodging the FBI for four decades? Luck, good or bad, played a major part in Georg's fate, and excellent timing helped him survive the Second World War. At 19, he enlisted as an officer cadet and completed his basic training. And in November 1942, Georg received his marching orders for the front. I see the platform, and I see the faces, and I see the train. Yes, I can still see that, smiling, trying to stay strong. And I looked out as long as I could, as long as I could see the platform, and we waved goodbye. But I, of course, I didn't know I would never return. Georg was lucky. He was sent to Tunisia in North Africa, rather than the Eastern Front, where the cold Russian winters devastated Hitler's army. By the time Georg reached Africa, Rommel was already losing his grip on the continent. And in 1943, within six months of his posting, Gertner's war was over and it was the end of the Africa Corps. But for every man we had lost, the enemy lost five. And at the end, 15 full divisions, 266,000 of their best men laid down their arms. Victory for the Allies came at a price. They had to find accommodation and facilities for nearly half a million prisoners of war. Europe was in turmoil, so America was the only alternative. Every available ship was requisitioned to transport hundreds of thousands of captive soldiers across the Atlantic to the United States. The Wakefield has delivered the goods. She has come back with another live cargo. A cargo of men who were once part of a mighty destructive force. A cargo of men now broken and defeated. Their journey showed little evidence of the devastation they expected from Hitler's propaganda. And even more shocking, Gärtner and his comrades traveled in the luxury of Pullman carriages rather than the notorious cattle trucks used by the Germans. In the United States, the men are assigned to permanent prison camps scattered all over the country. Here, they are busily engaged in all types of useful work. More than a million well-trained enemy soldiers are taken off the battlefields and thousands more continue to pour into internment camps every day as defeat slowly and surely closes in around their country. 
concern that American prisoners of war should be treated well in Germany, the US authorities ensured that life for the German POWs was as pleasant as possible, with newspapers, movies, sports and good food. The locals, always wary of prison breaks and resenting the comfort of their enemy, referred to the camps as the Fritz Ritz. But the holiday camp lifestyle would be short-lived as the Nazis lost their grip on Europe. Throughout the world, throngs of people hailed the end of the war in Europe. It is five years and more since Hitler marched into Poland. Years full of suffering and death and sacrifice. Now the war against Germany is won. By May 1945, it was time for the POWs to return to Europe. But the Europe they would be returning to was very different from the one they left. And the prospect was causing sleepless nights. I had read that in Potsdam and Yalta, the Allies had decided to return the POWs to their home regions. This was out of the question for me, because the Russians had overrun my home, Schweidnitz. I'd already spent two years in captivity, and that was enough. You have to break out. I was driven so hungry for freedom that I would have preferred death to captivity. My first thought was that I needed some money and a pair of pliers to cut the barbed wire and a map with directions, streets close to the camp. I hid them in a crack in the wall behind a skirting board. Time was running out. This was his only chance to escape the camp and a dismal return to what was left of his Germany. Georg had to cut through two fences and get out of sight as soon as possible. But how would he cross the wastes of New Mexico? I was already through the second fence and then I ran into the desert where I saw the train during the day. It was only a matter of time before the guards would notice his escape. I found an old, dilapidated house where I could hide. Verstecken. Professor Arnold Kramer is an expert on the hunt for the fugitive Georg Gärtner. Who says later on, it is uh, noted in this uh, file that roll call was taken that day in the barracks at 10 o'clock at night following a movie in the POW canteen. Uh, rather late for a standard POW camp. Uh, the alarm was sounded at exactly 10.13 p.m. Uh, camp guards were alerted and all barracks and rooms were searched, the files tell us. Uh, the guards also searched underneath the barracks, and uh, uh, the barracks were built on stilts to uh, prevent the uh, prisoners from uh, uh, tunneling. The Deming Police Department was finally contacted at 11 o'clock at night. Police officers were informed, and the uh, uh, police were put on high alert. Suddenly, two police cars drove up. They stopped, and the officers got out and talked. Georg was cornered. Was it to be over so soon? How could he hope to escape now? And then they jumped into their cars and raced off with their sirens screaming. I was lucky. They almost had me. The police were only out there on a routine patrol. They were called away to hunt for the fugitive, hiding only a few meters from them. His lucky streak would protect him throughout his decades on the run. But it was not without a price. 
he had taken his first step on a very long journey that would change his life forever with dangerous personal consequences for both him and his family. The search began here in Deming, New Mexico, where the prisoner of war camp was located. And from Deming, the chase centered on the desert. After all, this man was an Africa Corps man, and the authorities felt that an Africa Corps man would normally, naturally go into the desert. It never occurred to the authorities that, in fact, he might have uh, jumped onto a train which ran very close to his prisoner of war camp and taken him out of the area. Which is exactly what Gertner did. He was on his way out of New Mexico, heading for a new life in America. But where would he go? What would he do? And how would he survive? He learnt some English in the camp, but not enough to get by undetected. He had become a fugitive and would have to live on the edge and on his wits until his next lucky break. But it had to be better than going back to Germany and his hometown, now overrun by Russians. So here in America, land of the free, the 24-year-old German started a new life on the run. When he got off the train in California, he faced a huge challenge. How to find his way into an unfamiliar society, learn to fit in and go unnoticed. He was a wanted man, so he started at the bottom, on the outskirts of town, in no man's land. I was lucky to find shelter for the night. The next morning, I went out and mingled with the crowd in the street, careful not to look at anyone, because I didn't want anyone to look at me. I'd walk down the sidewalk as if I was going to work, just like them, but my heart was pounding like crazy. Pretending to be deaf and dumb was the only way he could avoid speaking while he perfected his English. You learn to speak English, but actually it was so frustrating that many a night I actually cried because of the frustration. I couldn't express myself, and I couldn't express myself in German. Neither language, one I couldn't use and the other one I didn't know how to use fully yet to express everything. He had to create a new identity, and quickly, one that would protect him and make his lack of past plausible. Gail Gertner and Germany were left behind. Enter the all-American Dennis Wiles. To avoid awkward questions, Dennis invents a backstory where his parents are killed in a tragic motor accident, and their traumatized son is raised in a lonely orphanage. It was never told in, in a sweeping story, you know, glowing with, with the memory of my past. It was reluctantly told, and because, first of all, it was not a, a good one. Uh, in other words, it was sad since I lost my parents. So it was a sad story in a sense, and, and, and I guess the people understood that I didn't want to talk too much about it. But Georg's parents hadn't died, and their son hadn't come back from the war. As Dennis tried to bury Georg's life and family in the past, he carved a rift in his personality that would haunt him forever. Regardless of the painful wrench, Dennis knew that America was a land of opportunity for all sorts of immigrants, and he aspired to be the best American the country had ever seen. It was really interesting. You're in a new culture and you observe the way people interact with each other. The Americans are quite polite towards each other and like the way you learn anything you imitate. I had to imitate what they do. The transformation was complete. Not only did Dennis speak English, 
He dressed, looked and behaved like a regular American guy. He was vanishing into everyday life without a trace. But the FBI was not going to give up the chase. The young German soldier was hunted down like a hardened war criminal. J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, took personal control of the search and hundreds of thousands of uh, wanted posters were hanged in uh, post offices all over the country. Uh, Gerald Gartner was now a full-fledged public enemy. And stacks of reports uh, were dutifully filed from coast to coast. And still he managed to elude the uh, FBI and the authorities. Dennis stayed on the move, taking jobs where no questions were asked. Dishwasher, lumberjack, cotton and fruit picker. Then his luck started to run out, and the day he'd always dreaded caught up with him. He got hurt on the job in a lumber camp and was taken to hospital, where he was asked for identification. He was faced with a dilemma, receive the treatment and be discovered, or risk infection and flee. I could not stand being locked up in any way, shape or form. I had no clue where the exit was. I just ran down the corridors, down the stairs, found myself in the laundry area. Had to run through the laundry and found the uh, exit, the street exit. I could uh, breathe again. Panic attacks and night sweats would become constant companions to Dennis. In July 1946, he received another blow. The last German POWs were finally being shipped home, and he would not be going with them. His thoughts turned to his homeland and family. Did they know he was missing? Did they even know if he was alive? The memory of Georg Gertner and Germany was burning a hole in him, and he wanted to go home. For 14 months, he struggled to stay in America, and now, without identity or travel documents, he couldn't leave. He had to find another way, across the Rio Grande into Mexico. I just uh, <laughs> counted on my instinct to have to get out of this country without papers. So I, I looked it all over, I walked to the bridge, to the middle, and I looked over to the Mexican side and it was pitch dark. It was maybe nine o'clock at night. It was dark everywhere. And on the American side, uh, uh, there were lights, street lights, people, music coming out of uh, clubs. And there was like day and night between the two countries. It was too much to risk and Dennis Wiles decided to stay for good. America in the 50s was in a post-war boom, and he intended to make the most of it and engage in life to the full. He divided his year between jobbing summers on the Pacific coast and running a winter ski school in the Sierra Nevada, incredibly allowing himself to be captured on film, proud of his achievements. His talent for skiing was learned in Georg's youth in the mountains of Germany. His touching backstory and natural expertise made him popular, and in the end, something of a local celebrity due to an unexpected show of heroism. For four perilous days, a crack streamliner lay marooned in the high Sierra Nevada mountains, following one of the worst blizzards in 50 years. One day it was storming as usual, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon, a call came in from the railroad to Southern Pacific and asking me, because I was known as the expert in cross-country skiing, if I would volunteer to take in food. One of their trains was, in, was caught in an a, a avalanche and an avalanche and couldn't move. I mean, we did not save the train in that sense, they were still stuck. 
but we, at least they had something to eat. I took some pictures outside. Yeah, I thought I tried to sell a picture and, and make some money because I had not worked in, in several weeks. Uh, the, there was no ski school. The, the newspaper office had taken some pictures of me, which was I, I was not happy about. It was a full-length picture in the Auburn Journal. I got lucky again, I got through, and always scary, scary and scarier. Along with five other prisoners of war, he had been on the run for six years now, but the FBI was not giving up. To Dennis Wiles, Georg Gertner was dead and buried, but for the authorities, he was very much alive and needed to be caught. For Gertner, no place was safe. The FBI was hot on his trail, and the exclusive club of half a dozen fugitives uh, was quickly apprehended. That is, there were six German prisoners who were outstanding, who had escaped during the war, and they were being caught one by one by the FBI. The exclusive club of fugitive prisoners of war was now down to a single man, and that was Georg Gertner. Uh, Hoover wouldn't relent, uh, wouldn't give up. He was determined to get his man, and uh, the search continued both in the United States and, according to the files, abroad as well. In Germany, a CIA agent tried to find Gärtner's hometown, Schweignitz, to get intelligence from friends and family, but failed. Germany's borders had been redrawn after the war, and the city had become Svinica, and wasn't recognizable as the middle-class, genteel place Georg left as a young man. Far from the wreckage, Dennis Wiles, a healthy young man in his 30s, moved to one of the world's most beautiful cities, San Francisco. Life was good, but even living a solitary existence, he was never entirely free from scrutiny. And how long could he hold together the rift he carved in his own personality when he buried Georg? He was increasingly emotionally unstable, and the whole of America would soon be shaken to its foundations by a political catastrophe. One day, uh, jogging uh, along in, in the area of the Golden Gate Park, this other jogger pulled up beside me and uh, said, hello, I know you from somewhere. I looked at him and uh, I didn't want to know him from anywhere. And I said, no, I don't think so. But he said, uh, but he said yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, he's speaking German, which I don't understand. I know you, don't I? From Africa. You served in the Africa Corps just like me. I played dumb, as if I didn't understand. I gave him a stupid look, and he finally left me alone. Had er mich doch noch einmal angeguckt, dann ist er dann doch zurückgefahren und hat mich allein gelassen. But it was a, a hair-raising experience when uh, somebody speaks German to me. He tried to bury his native language along with Georg, but the cracks were showing and his mental state was sliding out of control. The Kennedy assassination stopped the world in its tracks and released years of suppressed fears and wartime memories in Dennis. His life started falling apart, and if he was going to survive, he needed to pull himself back together fast. The future looked absolutely dark, and so I decided for that day I would go to the ocean and get some strength from nature, and I painted uh, a big wave that was coming in. It symbolizes actually the life, the struggle of life in a sense because it's 
the two elements are fighting each other. It's a certain struggle, the water against the land. And I feel alert because I, I have that same feeling of being attacked by the water. The whole thing about being a, a uh, escapee or a fugitive is, is not a good thing. Uh, if you wanted to, you could have a ner nervous breakdown any day. So unless you get off this negative feeling and build yourself a normal life with bad days and good days, you, you would not make it. Dennis's only option was to risk finding someone to share his life with. But where to begin? He started by going to dances. Someone came up behind me and said, would you like to dance? So I turned around and here was this uh, tall, uh, nice looking uh, um, man. And I said, uh, yes, thank you. So we moved to the dance floor and I turned around. I put my arms up around his shoulder. And right away, I could feel a, a connection. Dennis felt the connection too. And for the first time in 20 years, America's Most Wanted got the chance for a new lease of life and the possibility of some emotional comfort and support. Dennis asked Jean to marry him, but perhaps through fear or habit, failed to reveal his past. And perhaps because of a previous failed marriage, she was reluctant to ask. He brought into the relationship a man who had this horrible prison experience, war, none of which I knew, none of it. Dennis wanted desperately to stay in the US. He tried to bury his fears of discovery and deportation with the memories of Germany and Georg in the recesses of his mind. But suppressing his emotions floored his relationship with Jean. Was this why he could never reveal his true identity to her? If you want to stay out of out of a prison camp, in this case, a prison camp of war, a prison of war camp, or if you escape, I don't see how you can use your, your uh, name, your correct name, because then you might as well go to the nearest police station if you do and turn yourself in. That's impossible. Would have hated to, to be uh, arrested as an illegal alien and, and deported. What most people don't understand, when you're deported, you cannot return. So Dennis and Jean's relationship paid the price for the unspoken secret. But life together was better than life apart. So here you have two people. I'm looking for a safe harbor. <laughs> He's looking for a safe harbor. But never could we figure out who were these two people. So we established a pattern of our existence. Jean brought two children from her first marriage. So the Wiles appear to be the perfect American family, successful and prosperous. But with so many people in his life, how much longer could Dennis go without his past being discovered? The FBI had not given up, and 20 years after his escape, the scandal of Hitler's lost soldier was still attracting attention in the press. This unwittingly apt extract was written by journalist Herb Kahn in the San Francisco Chronicle. Wouldn't it be interesting to know if Mr. Georg Gartner, pride of the German tank division, is strolling down the streets of San Francisco at this very moment? And what impressions this elusive POW must have of our magnificent city and its unique ethnic makeup? In the 1970s, Dennis was still getting lucky breaks, and Mr. and Mrs. Wiles were offered the chance to open a tennis school at one of the most exclusive golf clubs on the West Coast. Dennis Wiles was finally enjoying recognition. His career was on the up. Surely he was unrecognizable to the authorities. By now, in his 50s, the only thing he shared with the young girl Gertner was his fingerprints. So the tennis venture 
turned out to be very successful, exciting. We had uh, celebrity tennis tournaments. We had uh, tennis star Bjorn Borg, um, uh, Alex Olmeda, all, uh, tennis stars coming into our tournaments, which had international participation. Very exciting. So w here we were, moderately, you know, pretty enviable place to be at our time of life. Celebrity tournaments were the season's highlights of the tennis club. So in 1972, celebrated newspaper columnist Herb Kahn, the very same journalist who condemned Gartner seven years before in the San Francisco Chronicle, was invited to a doubles tournament. The climax of the day was a match in which Kahn's partner was head coach Dennis Wiles. The irony of playing doubles with the man who wanted him behind bars for good was not lost on Wiles. But Khan never realized the true identity of the partner who helped him to victory. So we played together. I, I uh, thought that would be a good idea. <laughs> After what he said about me in a column, he wanted me arrested. <laughs> we played and we won his own tournament. And I shook hands and thanked him. And I got my silver platter. I still have it today. There's a certain, certain uh, fate and karma involved, and it's almost you can't explain the thing. It's a it's a kind of an enigma, and I like that. I like that, and it's cool. <laughs> but it was Dennis who was the enigma, still managing to outrun the FBI. The higher his profile, the more questions about his past, a past which didn't hold up to scrutiny. The exclusive golf club wanted a tennis coach with a known track record, so Dennis and Jean lost their venture. Living on his wits was playing havoc with Dennis's nerves. You can hear the sirens in, at night many times and wake up sweating, cold sweat. The hunt was on much closer to home too. A routine medical check revealed old cases of diphtheria and pneumonia. Jean's suspicions were aroused around questions she'd never dared to ask before. What is this? Uh, and I, I remember I, I called up the doctor, and I felt stupid because how can you ask a doctor, hey, uh, can you tell me about my husband? I don't know anything about him. <laughs> In his late 50s, Dennis's dream was falling apart at the seams. His experience told him to move on quickly, and this time he was going to take his family with him. No clue what, what what comes next, and but as it turned out, turned out okay in in Hawaii. Hawaii offered a chance for a new start on a remote island. Dennis was again successful, this time reinventing himself in the construction industry. Family life was rosy. This was somewhere where they could put all the questions behind them and perhaps plan for a happy retirement. But even here, there were clues to his split personality. The family home was named Casa Gemini, House of the Twins. The FBI had followed a cold trail for three decades. There was no trace of Georg Gärtner, Hitler's lost soldier. In 1975, decision-makers in Washington finally considered closing the case. Even so, wanted posters with the photographs of a now unrecognizable youth were still on display in the 80s. Dennis's anxiety never died away. He was always tormented by the rift between himself and the long-gone Gärtner. He couldn't let himself think what might have become of his mother, father and sister over the past decades. The pain they must have suffered, never knowing what happened to him. And ironically, just at the time when they were planning their retirement, his luck finally deserted him. Jean needed some papers for their retirement plan and just couldn't find anything. The fact that I could not find any record, I mean, it begs the question, well then, uh, he said all of these things. It, was he lying? 
well, what happened? And he had no explanation. And so she confronted me with that, and I had no real answer. By that time, I was getting a little tired from running, probably, and I was getting on, what, in the 60s? I was in the 60s. And she was right. I knew she was right. I had to do something, but what, I had no clue what to do. Um, again, a perfect opportunity for him to say, well, now, you know, something, a little thing I forgot to tell you on the way to the That's wedding right. chapel. And she said, said I'll, I packed my bags and I'm leaving. And of course, that, that cracked me wide open. And um, I could hear the taxi driver coming up. And I'm, I started to, to the door. And I just made one last try. I turned around and I said, because I thought maybe he committed some dreadful, you know, what could it be? I just said, Dennis, are, are you some kind of a criminal? So when she took her bags and went to the door, I said, I'll tell you. And I, then I made my confession to her. And then he broke down and he told me his story. And uh, I had all of these, uh, the, the emotions to wash over me. Uh, finally, I had an explanation. Finally, I could, I could understand all of the emotional deprivation for me, all of those years when I could never connect with him on a deep emotional level. He was never available to me. Um, all the other needs that are along with that in a marriage that I never got from him because he's locked up in that fear and that, that terror and, and anxiety and tension. So he, he described it to me, how he felt. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was just an outpouring, just a, a torrent, like a waterfall. In 1985, after 40 years on the run, this Dennis time, uh, Wiles turned himself in, and Hitler's lost soldier confessed all. My presence here today is due to the most precious aspect of my years of freedom, my wonderful wife of 21 years, Jean and her two children, who I helped raise as though they were my own. Faced with that, I confessed the truth to her and felt a portion of my tremendous bird being lifted from my shoulders. Today, with her love and support, I've come forward to surrender myself in an effort to remove the remain of the burden with the hope that I will be allowed to stay in the United States with my wife. I would like to express my thanks to the people here at the INS who have listened to my whole story. I hope it will help me realize my dream. Thank you. For six months, he was interrogated by the FBI, never knowing whether he would be incarcerated or deported. Miraculously, he was granted leave to stay. Finally, he was able to talk openly about his true identity. But it didn't come easy. And he talked of Georg as a different person. And uh, the face... Uh of this young man looks so uh, strange and skinny, slightly undernourished, but the uh, profile is the same. I, I can see that. Uh, a lot of memories are coming back, uh, and he, he, he's part of my life. He's part of the first uh, 24 years of my life. Jean stood by Dennis and even managed their press and television appearances. She wanted him to heal the rift with his past and urged him to contact his family, though by now he couldn't even remember how to speak German. And then I encouraged him, which he finally did do, to call um, his um, sister in Braunschweig in Germany. And that was such an emotional time. And that's... Uh... That must have been a really bizarre call. My father said it lasted about 10 minutes. My mother couldn't speak a word of English. 
My uncle no German. He said, hello, Lotte. And then she said, ah, it's you, Georg. She recognized his voice immediately. All the time he was on the run, Georg's niece idolized her fugitive uncle. It was the way it is for most kids at that age. Home is a complete bore, and I dreamed. I hoped, I really believed that one day he would come and take me out into the big, wide world. Yes, he was the proverbial uncle from America. Lots of people had that dream, America the land of opportunity. But I really had an uncle in America, and I really believed he was still alive. Hitler's last soldier finally came home in 1986. Georg Gärtner returned to Germany. Well, they, they're wonderful feelings when, when you come back to your roots. There's no question about it. Whatever these, wherever they come from, whether it's the smell or the sight or the sound of, of your, ho your homeland or Heimat, it's an incredibly beautiful uh, feeling. And I'm glad I was able to, to do it. It was wonderful. Absolutely. At first, the reunion is a joyous one. But inevitably, awkward questions and painful discoveries emerge from the past. Georg's parents had been alive until only a few years ago, waiting all this time for just a word, just the hope he was alive. Why had he never contacted them? Here they are at Christmas time sitting at the table with a picture of me uh, on the table. I didn't know that they did that. And it's very touching. But I didn't even have a clue that they were even alive. So I should have come back sooner. And you're sad that you were unable to see them alive. The prodigal son traveled through his homeland as if it were a foreign country. He was in turmoil again. After years on the run, he was finally free to stay in America, but now felt the strong pull of Gertner's roots. He decided to stay on to try and heal the wounds of the past, to relearn German, and perhaps make a little money from painting. But what happened to Dennis Wiles's family in this story? For a year and a half, I grieved over this loss. I hear nothing from him. Um, finally, after about a year and a half, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was still with my, my important job and lots of things. I began to make some new friends, and finally I started going dating. Jean could bear the desertion no longer and finally filed for divorce. Gail Gertner was on the run again this time from his emotional self. There was nothing to go back to the States for, but there seemed little to stay in Germany for either. His family's joy at his return was cooling. Guilt hung over him. He couldn't make a living from painting alone, and he wasn't eligible for a German soldier's pension. Even the familiar buildings of his middle-class youth were tired or ruined now they were in Poland where respect for their grand German past was dead and buried with the war. It seemed too late for the two parts of his life to come together, so he made a painful decision. He would have to live the rest of his life as Dennis Wiles and let Georg Gärtner go once and for all. Today, Dennis Wiles lives in Boulder, Colorado. His life is no longer overshadowed by the threat of others. He enjoys a quiet retirement, a little painting, watching TV, and meeting friends. But life is not without adventure. Hitler's last soldier is on his last mission, to reconstruct his past. Georg Gärtner is now the subject of his research at the local library, and he talks of him as if of a long-lost comrade in arms in the quest to find himself. 
it is not easy to, to uh, take on another name and make another life. That, that causes pain, and that, because that Georg Gärtner had a, had, had a good life also, and he didn't do anything wrong in that sense. He didn't commit any crimes, so he's ever present in my past. Since 1945, I had Dennis Wiles, and I had a biography of my own. It was painful to change to Dennis Wiles, and it was painful to go back to Georg Gärtner. And that is to this day. Dennis is a regular visitor to the Boulder Library, where he attempts to piece together the fragments of his life and reclaim his past with the help of his friend, Chris Hendrickson. Giant mountains. Yeah, giant mountains, yeah. We'll see what's there is. There's a map, yeah. Dennis slips between German and English without even seeming to realize it. Old maps and books help him recall the long-lost Germany of his youth, the mountains where he learned to ski, and the now Polish town that shaped the young Gerl Gärtner. In April of 1991, I received this postcard from him, from Berlin, and I was really surprised to read it because he has an example of how the two different people and how different they are, Dennis and Georg. As he's writing to me, he starts off in English, mm -hmm. and he begins to go into German. But this is a personality of Dennis, and the way it's written is in the personality of Dennis. But then as he continues in German, he becomes Georg, and his writing changes completely into there are two different people here. They are not reconciled. And this person, this is Dennis, and this is Georg. They're two completely different people. And I was uh, amazed to see that I could find them both on the same postcard. I think he's been trying ever since uh, the 80s when uh, he turned himself in and reconciled himself with the American authorities. Uh, I think he's been researching his past, sort of like as if a person would research another person in history. And I think he's doing rather well, but I'm not sure he'll ever reconcile the two because they're so different. They're completely different people. Dennis still paints the seascapes that depict the awesome power of nature, the relentless attack of waves against land, the relentless struggle that rages within himself. Most of us are lucky. Our present is a continuation of our past. There is no real separation. For Dennis, this can never be true. As a young captive soldier, he made a bid for freedom. But freedom was nowhere to be found. He was left wandering in a personal no man's land, cut off from his family and cut off from his past. It has haunted him ever since. It was a high price to pay. The man who is Dennis Wiles and Gerl Gertner will continue to search for his true identity in a never-ending struggle to heal his two selves. This is a marked man, a young officer cadet from the North Africa campaign, a prisoner of war in the New Mexico desert, a fugitive for 40 years, a ski hero, a husband, and a long-lost son. So who is he, Dennis Wiles or Gail Gertner? We, and maybe he, will never know. Whoever he is, he has paid a terrible price to live in the land of the free. But now in his 80s, he has his health, some good friends, and his hobbies. Given everything that has happened to Hitler's last soldier, who could want more?